Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of ChrisMasterjohnPhD.com, and you are watching Masterclass with Master John, and this is the sixth in a series of lessons on the antioxidant defense system. Today we're going to be zeroing in on glutathione. We saw before that glutathione is a cofactor for glutathione peroxidase, and in the aqueous portions of the cell, that's going to help convert hydrogen peroxide to water. We also saw that glutathione peroxidase is present in cellular membranes, where it helps convert the more dangerous lipid peroxides into the less dangerous hydroxy fatty acids. And we've also seen that glutathione is recycling vitamin C. Vitamin C is helping, taking, helping to take the burden of supplying reducing power out of the membrane and placing it on glutathione. Glutathione is then going to take the burden of supplying that reducing power and place it on the system of energy metabolism so that ultimately hydrogen ions and electrons, meaning reducing power, are coming from food molecules, particularly glucose, with the help of B vitamins brought to glutathione. Glutathione can bring it to vitamin C. Vitamin C can deliver it to vitamin E. Vitamin can use it to neutralize lipid peroxyl radicals in the cellular membrane. So what is glutathione? Well, glutathione is a tripeptide, meaning it's made from three amino acids. We get amino acids from dietary protein. So glutathione is ultimately derived from dietary protein. The three amino acids are shown on the screen, and they are glutamic acid or glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. The gluta in glutathione refers to the glutamate. The thigh own in glutathione refers to the sulfur that's in the side chain of cysteine. That SH is the same SH that we see in the abbreviation of glutathione, GSH, and it is emphasized even in that abbreviation because it's the part of the molecule that engages in every important reaction, so that sulfhydryl group is critical. And we refer to that sulfhydryl group in the part of the word thione, because thione or thiol, thi comes from the Greek meaning sulfur. And we call glutathione a thiol because it has an SH or a sulfhydryl group. This SH looks a lot like an OH and behaves a lot like an OH, except for the presence of sulfur. In chemistry, all refers to an OH group or an alcohol. So a thiol refers to an SH, or the sulfur-containing analog of an alcohol. And we can call this a thiol group, and we can call the glutathione molecule on the whole a thiol. When these are joined together, they are called amino acid residues. So we have a gamma glutamyl residue, a cysteinyl residue, and a glycyl residue. And we can call the molecule on the whole gamma glutamyl cysteinyl glycine. The gamma is very significant, but for reasons we're going to talk about in the next lesson rather than now. So glutathione is abbreviated GSH because G stands for glutathione and refers to the whole rest of the molecule besides the sulfhydryl group. The SH refers to the sulfhydryl group, aka the thiol group. And to abbreviate this GSH, means it's basically a way of looking at the rest of the molecule and saying, we don't really care about you. Like, we're just going to call you G. And looking at the sulfhydryl group and saying, aha, this is where it's at. So when we have GSH, we're literally trying to demonstrate what is happening to that sulfhydryl group. On the screen, you can see that GSH can give up a hydrogen ion and an electron to become GS dot. That dot signifies an unpaired electron, and that's the glutathionyl radical. Now, when we saw ascorbic acid in the last lesson, we said that the ascorbyl radical has this unpaired electron. It's highly reactive. It needs to do something to get that electron paired up, and its solution was to donate another electron and become dehydroascorbate. The glutathionyl radical has the exact same problem that it's got to pair up that electron, but it has a different solution. Its solution is to pair up with a second glutathionyl radical to form GSSG. 
The reason that this is called GSSG and not GGSS or something else is literally because we're demonstrating visually an abbreviation of what the actual chemical structure looks like. Literally, the S, the sulfur, of one glutathione is joined to the other S, the other sulfur, of the other glutathione. And literally, it's a mirror image where you could look at it in cross-section, just cut it in half, and you would see that sulfur is bound to sulfur, and then behind one sulfur is the whole rest of the glutathione molecule, G. Behind the other sulfur is the whole rest of the glutathione, other glutathione molecule, the other G. Glutathione is not just an antioxidant. It's also a powerful detoxifier. So to briefly review the three stages of liver detoxification and how glutathione fits in, we see on the screen three phases that we could say apply to xenobiotic metabolism in general. Xenobiotics are biological agents that are foreign, xeno. Like xenophobia is fear of foreigners. So anything that the body regards as foreign. It could be a natural substance in a food, or it could be a drug that humans invented, or it could be an environmental toxin. Whatever the body decides doesn't belong in the body undergoes xenobiotic metabolism. Shown on the screen is a drug, just as an example. So we can have a drug that's going to undergo phase one of detoxification, and that is oxidation to a reactive metabolite. That reactive metabolite is actually more dangerous than the original drug. However, it lays down the framework or it prepares the molecule to be able to be conjugated in phase two. The second phase is conjugation and there are other molecules besides glutathione that engage in conjugation. Glutathione is just one. But when it does so, the enzyme glutathione S transferase, or one of the many glutathione S transferases, takes the reactive metabolite and adds glutathione, that's called conjugation, and we have drug SG. Once again, this SG literally demonstrates that the sulfur is binding to the drug, and the whole rest of the glutathione molecule is behind the sulfur. Now, this conjugate is, first of all, it's much safer to have around than that reactive metabolite. If you had an imbalance favoring too much phase one and not enough phase two, that could actually cause damage to the cell because the reactive metabolites are so dangerous. So glutathione conjugation quells that dangerousness, but more importantly in the overall scheme, it's making the drug more water soluble and easier to excrete. Phase three is a transporter is gonna take the conjugate and put it out into the bile. From the bile, it can eventually be excreted either in the feces or the urine. Acetaminophen toxicity is very related to glutathione metabolism. It's also very important to our healthcare system because over 50 million Americans use acetaminophen every week. And for the most part, that doesn't cause any problems. But in high doses, it can cause hepatic necrosis, which means liver cells die a gruesome and messy death. And when that happens, we have 10,000 hospital visits as a result of that per year leading to 500 deaths and direct costs of almost $90 million per year. So what's happening in acetaminophen toxicity is normally, at a low dose, acetaminophen does not utilize glutathione conjugation for its detoxification. And it doesn't tax the glutathione pool at all. But there's a tiny amount of the acetaminophen that generates a reactive metabolite called NAPQI that is detoxified with glutathione. And as the dose increases, that NAPQI metabolite increases, and the tax on the glutathione supply increases. At very high doses, as a prerequisite for toxicity, you have 90% of the glutathione pool depletion. Now remember, when you're conjugating something to excrete it in the urine, that glutathione is leaving the body, right? So this isn't a reversible reaction where the glutathione can be recycled like an antioxidant defense. This is literally using up and consuming glutathione. Now, when you have 90% glutathione depletion, you have negative consequences to the cell from that alone because glutathione is critical to antioxidant defense. As we'll see later, glutathione is a key regulator of protein function, so you're dysregulating protein function. But also, when glutathione is 90% depleted, 
Now you have NAPQI accumulating that cannot be detoxified by the glutathione, and that NAPQI is a reactive metabolite that's going to damage other proteins and other structures in the cell. So you have this combination of glutathione depletion and NAP, NAPQI accumulation that together are wreaking havoc on the cell and causing those cells to die a very gruesome death. In the worst case scenarios, that leads to people dying a very gruesome death. If you go to the emergency room, they're going to treat you with N-acetylcysteine. That is meant to supply the cysteine necessary for the synthesis of new glutathione. And so even the treatment for this toxicity is all based around glutathione metabolism. Glutathione is not just an antioxidant and a detoxifier, it's also a key regulator of protein function. It does this partly by controlling disulfide bonds within proteins themselves, and it can also form disulfide bonds with proteins and act as a molecular switch to turn the protein on or off. The picture on the screen shows a cartoon version of how disulfide bond formation affects protein function. Any protein, its function is always determined by its three-dimensional structure. And if you change that structure and that shape, you're going to change its function. Just like a key, whether it gets into a lock, is dependent on its particular shape. A small change to the shape of a key, even that you wouldn't notice by looking at it, is going to change, ca cause a major change to the function of that key. So the same thing with proteins. Now, if you look at disulfide bonds, they can be between proteins or they can be within proteins. Before we said that for two molecules of glutathione to join together to form GSSG, they have to oxidize first. So when sulfhydryl groups are reduced as SH, they don't bind together. It's only when they're oxidized as S dot that they bind together. So on the left we have Proteins that have their sulfidyl groups in the reduced state, and this protein does not bind to that protein. We also have these cysteine residues. This one does not bind to this one in the reduced state. Now this is significant because imagine that this protein were stretched out and unfolded across the screen. You could have a linear protein that wouldn't be folded together. But if you can form disulfide bonds, as shown here, you can fold that protein together, and if you have a disulfide bond here and here, hold it in that folded structure. You can also have disulfide bonds join one protein to another. So in their oxidized states, the disulfide bonds form, and they connect far away amino acid residues within a protein to fold it into a three-dimensional shape, or they connect amino acid residues in one protein to another to bind them together. On the right hand side of the screen is shown how this typically plays out inside and outside the cell. Inside the cell you have a really high concentration of glutathione and a very reducing environment. So the sulfhydryl groups can, tend to be in their reduced states as SH. Outside the cell you have much less glutathione and you have a much more oxidizing environment so you tend to have a lot of disulfide bond formation outside the cell. And the cell is able to control how reducing the environment is based on how re reducing the glutathione pool is. And what's shown on the screen is the typical scenario, but there are exceptions. For example, in the case of lung fluid, you have mucus proteins that need to have their sulfurs in reduced states in order to be fluid. If the environment of lung tissue is too oxidizing, disulfide bonds will form between mucus proteins and the mucus will glom up together. It'll lose its fluidity and you'll get congested. We can quantify how reducing the glutathione pool is using the redox status, which is expressed in millivolts. The redox potential is the potential of one thing to oxidize another thing. And we have arbitrarily defined a zero point, and we can say that anywhere along the spectrum, whether it's on one side or the other side of zero, the lower the redox potential, the greater the 
ability of something to donate electrons, meaning to be a reducing agent. As we go up in redox potential, the greater the likelihood that something's going to take an electron, making it an oxidizing agent. And as we move along that path, we go from decreasing reducing power and increasing oxidizing power. Glutathione is always going to have a negative redox status, but we can control how negative it is with our cellular enzymes, and nutrition and metabolism can support our ability to control it in that way, or can impair our ability to control it in that way. And so part of the way that we can measure someone's health is to look at the expected redox status of their glutathione pool. If we have a lot of GSH relative to GSSG, we have a very reducing pool, and we're gonna have tend to have not only proteins that have their sulfhydryl groups reduced, but we also have glutathione that has its sulfhydryl group reduced. So we're not going to have protein-protein interactions, and we're not going to have glutathione binding to proteins. By contrast, if we have less GSH and more GSSG, then we'll get disulfide bonds between proteins and other proteins, disulfide bonds within proteins, and disulfide bonds between glutathione and proteins. So we can have GSS protein, and that's called S-glutathionylation of the protein. And that is a molecular switch that happens when the glutathione pool is less reducing and relatively more oxidizing. Keep in mind this is always relative. There's always more GSH than GSSG, and the glutathione pool is always reducing and is always negative. When I depict on the screen that there's less GSH and more GSSG, that's not literally less GSH than GSSG. It's just helping to emphasize that you have a situation favoring more GSSG than you usually would and less GSH than you usually would. To take an example of how we could quantify this, we could say that a very negative redox status for glutathione would be negative 200 millivolts, and a very oxidizing environment would be negative 100 millivolts. Those are the extremes of what you might expect to measure in someone's plasma. Usually in a young, healthy person, you're going to see a redox status in the plasma of closer to negative 150 millivolts. But these also vary according to what you're looking at. So in plasma, you tend to have a less negative value because you have less glutathione. Whereas inside a cell, you'll tend to have a more negative value because of more glutathione. But actually, it depends on the compartment of the cell. So the cells very carefully regulate which compartment should have which reducing power of its own glutathione pool. And in the extracellular fluid of the lung, you have this crazy exception where a healthy glutathione redox status is negative 200 millivolts, which is way more reducing than what you find in plasma and most other extracellular fluids, but it's actually less reducing than what you find in certain subcellular compartments. So why is that important to lung tissue? Well, number one, the glutathione is needed to reduce mucus fluid and keep mucus proteins from forming disulfide bonds between one another to maintain mucus fluidity. Number two, glutathione binds to nitric oxide and reacts to produce nitrosoglutathione. Nitrosoglutathione is our endogenous bronchodilator, which we need to be able to breathe well. If you look at asthma, what you find is that as you increase from the healthy state an increase in severity from mild to moderate asthma to severe asthma, you find continuous oxidation of the glutathione pool, both in the plasma and also in the lung fluid. So if you look at these values in the plasma, you're going to go from negative 137 and negative 120 to negative 94. And in the lung fluid, you're going to go from negative 200 to negative 150 to negative 124 to negative 120 to 90, negative 94 as the severity of asthma increases. Beyond that, nitrosoglutathione concentrations 
Decline from 200 to 500 in healthy subjects, that's a nanomolar, to 60 nanomolar in subjects with asthma, to nearly zero in a severe acute asthma attack. Think about what that means. Asthmatics are losing their endogenous bronchodilator, and they're compensating for that by using a pharmaceutical bronchodilator to quell the signs and symptoms of the asthma attack. Well, what that means is that if we think about how nutrition and how metabolic health impact glutathione status, we can brainstorm ways that might be able to help with asthma in a natural way by improving the health of the glutathione pool rather than by compensating for it with pharmaceutical drugs. So to round out this discussion, it could be useful to look at the association between acetaminophen use and asthma. Keep in mind that the data on the screen are from an observational study where we can't determine cause and effect with any confidence. But since we know mechanistically that glutathione is important in protecting against asthma, and that acetaminophen depletes glutathione, then it's reasonable to, at least at a hypothetical level, interpret this as a causal association. If it is causal, what's remarkable is that in this study, acetaminophen use was defined as taking the medication on more than three days in the year preceding the survey. This is data from just about 2,500 Korean school children, ages 8 to 13. And we're looking at, first of all, the odds of ever having been diagnosed with asthma, the odds of currently being diagnosed with asthma, and the odds of having a bronchial hyperreactivity test that are indicative of asthma. And on the right column, we have the odds ratio. Everything is defined against an odds ratio of 1 for not having a family history of asthma and not using acetaminophen. That's arbitrary. But what it means is that as we go to increasing odds, then an odds ratio of two is twice the odds ratio as one. An odds ratio of four is four times the risk and so on. So if we consider people who do not have a family history, then the use of acetaminophen doesn't have much of an effect on the odds of ever having been diagnosed with asthma. But if they do have a family history, then use of acetaminophen in the past year is more than double the likelihood of having been diagnosed with asthma. If we look at current asthma, then expectedly the association is more strong. So if they do not have a family history of asthma, then use of acetaminophen is not significantly associated. But if they do have a family history of asthma, then use of acetaminophen makes them over four times as likely to have current asthma as they would if they had not used acetaminophen. That's a really large association. If we look at the bronchial hyperreactivity index, it's not as large. It's 2.6, but even still, that's double the risk. So cause and effect, I don't know. But I know that acetaminophen causes glutathione depletion, and that glutathione depletion is likely to be very central to asthma. So I would err on the side of being very careful with acetaminophen use if you have a family history of asthma. All right, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to look at how does nutrition and metabolism and metabolic health impact this glutathione system. Hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you're anticipating the next lesson. Signing off for now, this is Chris Masterjohn of ChrisMasterjohnPhD.com, and you've been watching Masterclass with Masterjohn.